Wow, you don't even need a sermon now. I'll just let you go home. Kirsten, I have to admit, he is not risen is the most clever thing somebody could say at 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I got up at 4 o'clock this morning. I'm a little wound up. Alex, you'll have to forgive me, but you should be used to me by now. It's only been 20 whatever years. Becoming an old man. Oh, somebody uh, commented online, they're headed to Augusta. Is that what's going on this week, Tracy? Is it the, the golf? Where's the golf happening? Is it Augusta? They're headed to Augusta, and she asked if we could hear her singing. Anybody? Did you hear anybody singing from their car? Anybody? <laughs> Patty, they couldn't hear you singing. That was Patty Romano. Patty and her husband, Lee, who I call Lee Ray for obvious reasons. Think about it. All right. Today we're going to talk about how God can use sadness to bring joy. And um, I don't think I need to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's been a crazy year. Is that an understatement? Uh, it's just, you know, um, last year I remember Easter sunrise Sunday morning on my porch doing the service. And I will tell you, when I finished the service, I was overwhelmingly sad. I, I don't even have a good way to describe it. It was a combination of loss and frustration, irritation, to be honest. And you just name all the emotions and put them in a little ball, and that's kind of how I felt. And many of you this year have had a lot of those. Even this morning, some of you may have a couple of them. Uh, uh, and, and here's the thing. You think, what good can come out of something like this? They recently did a study about church attendance, and for years, it's been that young people don't want to come back to church, young people don't want to come back to church, and in most recent studies, because of COVID, one of the things that's happened is young people are wanting to go back to church. Now, that's desperation, to be honest, but, but, but to me, you know, even if this, that's the glimmer of hope that comes from all this shenanigan mess, um, praise God. Now, let me tell you something I don't know. That's always a good start for me pretty broad subject, but there it is. I don't know what you're struggling with. Um, I don't know if you're struggling with something at home. Um, I don't know if you had a doctor's report this week or if you're waiting on one. That's the funnest. When the doctor says, well, we looked at your reports. We need to see you immediately. That's the worst. Um, I, I don't know if it's something in your marriage. I don't know if it's a relationship, one of your kids. Um, if you're just struggling, maybe you're struggling with depression or discouragement or anxiety. Listen, there are all kinds of struggles in life. Some are physical, some are emotional, some are spiritual, and usually it's all of those things. And I don't know what you're struggling with, but I, I tend to want God to destroy my enemies and bless me. Anybody else like that? I mean, I'm Okay, let me just give you an example. So yesterday, actually it was Friday. Friday I was coming over to visit the hospital. I set up some chairs and for a concert and then I had to go visit a hospital and then I had to go visit another hospital. So I had a lot of driving ahead. And I take a little shortcut called Taylor Creek Road. And if you don't know what Taylor Creek Road is, it is a 35 mile an hour speed limit. I would love to tell you I drive 35 on that road, but I don't drive a lot faster than 35. Let me just say it that way. But I do push the limits of radar detectors, okay? But I don't drive that fast, I really don't, on that road. I'm very careful, I, it's a residential street, it's very narrow. Well, on this day, as I turned right, right in front of me, a police officer, a state patrolman, pulled right in front of me, probably about 20 feet in front of me, so which, of course, I went, oh, man, now I really got to go slow, right? You, you've never done that? Am I the only non-Christian in this room? Okay, so, so um, this is my struggle, okay? So, so I think, well, it's no problem. I just set the cruise control, and he's actually going faster than me, um, uh, which is always good, and so I'm just letting him go. Well, a work truck comes up behind me fast. I mean fast. People drive like 80 on that road. Well, that guy comes behind me. He's tailgating me, but all of a sudden he goes, I think he looked to pass me and saw lights on top of a car and said, hmm, this seems like a good place. So as we came up to part of the road, the officer is getting ready to turn left, and I see him kind of do that thing where you pull right and then pull left with your blinker. And as he does that, next to me, a Miata going about 100 or more miles per hour passes me. Passes me, and I think I'm about to see a full-blown 
accident with an officer in front of me, and what am I going to do? Because the officer had started to turn, and this guy is going. The officer must have looked in the rearview mirror because he kicked his lights on. And the guy, I'd never seen him, he ought to go from 100 to 2 in so fast. And then he pulled the guy over. And something inside of me did this. Yes! <laughs> now, let me tell you something about me, though. I would love to tell you that I always drive below the speed limit. But that would be a lie, and pastors aren't supposed to lie on Sundays, only Monday through Friday. But, um, so, so I'd love to tell you that. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been on I-95 just following the flow of traffic and seen a police officer and thought, God, give me mercy, right? But when somebody else does it, get them, right? And we talked about Moses a few weeks ago. I think Moses, near the end of his life, was the same way. Like, God, you know, if you just swallow a couple of people, they'll listen to me more. You know, you did that early on. But, but could you do that now? Because they're not listening this time. And there's something in us that wants that revenge. But here's what I want you to know today. We love revenge. We love comfort, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But God can even use your struggle, your pain, your hurt, your doubt, even your fear, like Rodney talked about, even your anger, to do a miracle in your life. The story of Easter over and over again is a story from sadness where many of you may be right now to joy. And you just have to wait and hang on in the middle. So I'm going to go through three things today that you may or may not know, and I'm sure you've never heard this in an Easter story. I tell people all the time, I preach the same message every week. It's, it's God loves you. He cares about you. He doesn't want to leave you where you are. He wants you to bless other people. And that's what you're going to hear today, all right? Number one, hurtful people can be used by God. Luke 18, Jesus says this ahead of time. This is ahead of the story. Jesus says, they will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they didn't know what he was talking about. It, 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 these are men. So most wives are like, yeah, we see that. We understand that. They, they had no idea. Jesus is talking and he's saying, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. And the disciples are like, all right, so who's in charge? I mean, they clueless, clueless. And yet God was going to use that to make a huge difference. Now, I love this chair. I, I have... A, a recliner at home, and I can't fall asleep in it, but guess what? I love these zero-gravity chairs. You can kick back. It's a little too heavy to carry on to the beach, and I'm probably a little too heavy for the chair, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> but, you know, when I sit in a chair and I get comfortable, I think about my dad when I was a kid. My dad had his favorite recliner. Did any of you have a dad with a favorite recliner? So I can remember my dad and his recliner. My brother and I, we're both ADD. I'm ADHD. My brother is just ADD, sometimes an H, but sometimes not. We're both pastors now. Something's wrong with both of us. But when we were little kids, you know, we're like five and six years old. Saturday morning, my dad would be asleep in that chair, no eye open. And we'd come up to him and we'd go, Daddy, what are we going to do today? It's one of my mom's favorite memories is us coming to his chair and going, Daddy, what are we going to do today? Now, my dad, totally comfortable, out, one eye. What do you guys want to do today? Let's go for a bike ride. We'll go to Matheson Hammock. And sometimes he would say, okay. Yay! We were all excited. Now, what did my dad do? My dad left the comfort of his chair for his children. Think about how comfortable heaven is. No more pain, no more sorrow. You get out of bed and you get out of bed. You don't make noise when you sit down. How many of you are at the I make noise when I sit down stage? All right, that's very, that's very advanced. My kids are like, what's that noise? It's your dad sitting down. 
Oh! Throw your back out picking something up off the floor that weighs one ounce. If you haven't done that yet, that's a fun one. Brian, you feel my pain? So imagine heaven totally comfortable, and Jesus loves you so much, he's willing to leave all of that and endure the worst torture any of us could think of. Why? Because there is a cost and a penalty for sin. And instead of having each of us try to pay it, which we never could, Jesus paid it for all of us. That sacrifice is beyond our understanding, and that's okay. And it's okay to know that and to say, I don't get that. Luke 22, we read a little further, Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard, and he discussed with them how he might betrayed, betray Jesus. You ever had somebody betray you? Somebody you thought was your friend? Somebody you thought was on your side, and all of a sudden you realize they've been plotting against you, they've been lying to you. If you haven't had that happen yet, good for you. The Bible says they were delighted. That word for delighted in the Greek means they cheered. They're like, yes, got him now. And agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. See, when Luke was writing this down, he's getting this account from the disciples. And they're recalling it. And as they're recalling it, can I tell you something about this memory? It's painful. You and I have painful memories. You and I have things we don't like. You and I have somebody in our life that hurt us. And you do have to forgive a person, okay? But forgiveness is different than saying what they did was okay. What they did was not okay. What Judas did was not okay. Did God use it? Yes. God will use the pain in your life. He didn't cause it. We're individuals, we're allowed to have free will. God can let you be dumb today and do something dumb and hurt somebody else, and yet he can use the pain that's been inflicted on you if you'll let him. If you can walk in forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean letting the person hurt you again. It doesn't mean saying what they did was okay. It doesn't mean denying the pain, but it means to say, you know what, I choose to to forgive you. By the way, you may not even be there yet. You may be at the, I choose to want to choose when I'm ready to choose to forgive you. I've been there. Like, God, I'm not ready to forgive that person yet. Would you help me to even want to want to, to want to want to, to want to want to forgive them? Right? You ever that far along? I'm thankful that even Jesus wept when he was here on earth. Jesus felt pain. It's okay to feel pain. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be hurt. It's okay to feel betrayed. It's okay to sometimes feel alone, even when you're not. Is there a hurtful person? This is your first challenge. You need to forgive so that you can move forward. Now, forgiveness takes time, and forgiveness is in steps. By the way, it's not a one-time thing either, because when another memory comes back, you might be frustrated again. What do you do? You choose to forgive again, not because of feelings, but because of faith. Number two, fears and doubts are normal. If you have fears, if you have doubts, that's normal, okay? So this is a plumber's tool. You may or may, have not, may or may not have ever seen this. A lot of people haven't seen this. It's a pretty specific tool, so a lot of people don't have it. When I first worked for a plumber, he would hand me a new tool, and he would say, go use it, and I would go, what? And I would have a thousand questions. And then the first time I tried it, the first time he wanted me to try to to put some copper pipe together with a blowtorch. Oh, imagine me with a blowtorch. Doesn't that sound fun? I had lots of questions. I messed up. I was nervous. I was freaked out. You know what this does? When you, if you have a bathtub that has a drain, this helps you to remove the inside of that drain. If you look at your drain, it probably has a little X inside of there, and this fits right inside there and helps you to unscrew your drain. But if you don't know that, guess what? You have to ask. Sometimes in life, in the Christian life, we have fear and we have doubt, and it's okay. We don't know everything. Listen to the story, Matthew 28, 1, and then we'll skip to verse 5. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. By the way, Mary Magdalene is the one who had seven demons cast out of her. That woman had to have some faith. 
By the way, it says that as they were on the way, they said, who's going to roll away the stone? They didn't have all the answers while they were on the journey. You ever feel that way? A few verses later, they go to the tomb. The angel says to the women, do not be afraid. Which I always find funny that angels say, don't be afraid. Because what usually happens next is you're afraid. This word for be afraid is phobia. You ever have a phobia? You ever have a fear out of nowhere? If you haven't yet, it's not... Anybody ever do that? Come on, we'll be honest today. Anybody ever have a fear just out of nowhere? All of a sudden, I've had it. Weirdest thing. Can I tell you the worst one? This is, this is, you're going to laugh, and it's okay. I don't mind. You can make fun of me. Pirates of the Caribbean. I had a panic attack right before getting on Pirates of the Caribbean one time. No idea why. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, I was like, nope. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, people. Pirates of the Caribbean. This is, this is not like, you know, this is first grade ride. And my brain said, my brain said, you're fine. It's not a big deal. And my body said, nay, nay, do not get on that ride. <laughs> Out of nowhere for no reason. So when he says, don't fear, I want to say to the angel, easy for you to say, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. We know from another passage it says, tell his disciples and Peter, which I love that part because it's like Peter needed a little extra reassurance. He has risen from the dead, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Now, I've told you, I love that too, because like the angel, God said, go to earth and do this. And it's like he finishes and he goes, okay, did my job, out. And I don't know if they go, Phew. I don't know what noise angels, maybe it's like an owl and just like they're just... They're gone. I don't know how it works. But he says, now I've told you. Right? So the women hurried away from the tomb. Listen. Afraid, yet filled with joy. And ran to tell his disciples. Listen, you can be conflicted even about your feelings. You can know you trust God and yet be afraid. You can know you trust God and yet feel alone. You can know God is with you and yet feel alone. You can know that you know that God will take care of you and yet something inside of you is unsettled and it's okay to be human and to let God walk you through those moments where you need his touch. So the women go back to tell the disciples, and this does not go well. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. I love this word in the Greek. This is my favorite word in the Greek. It means, it's very hillbilly, it means a tall tale is how we would interpret it. They thought these women were making up a story. They're like, yeah, purple cow and a guy who planted trees all over the country. What are you talking, right? Right? Tall tale. It seemed like nonsense to them. The women came back and said, Jesus is alive. And they're like, yeah, let me tell you a story about a man named Jed. Right? And, and they're just like, what are you even talking about? But then it continues a, a few verses later. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Which, by the way, if you have never been quiet or in a room and having a conversation or totally focused on something and all of a sudden somebody appears, even if they walk in, it freaks you out. Imagine Jesus actually appears. They were startled and frightened. It's normal. Thinking they saw a ghost. And then he says to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? And then listen to what he says. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Listen, you know what Jesus was saying? It's okay to ask questions. Can, can I tell you something, Christians, those, those of you here who have faith in Christ? Don't ever be afraid of questions from people. People ask me questions every day, all the time. And sometimes they'll come to me and go, Pastor, I didn't really want to ask you this. And then they ask me something, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that one's not even big. And then sometimes they'll ask me something, and I'm like, ooh. And, and let me tell you how I answer sometimes. I, I don't know. That's, that's I don't know, by the way. That's male version of I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Right? But sometimes I say, oh, no, 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 that's, a, that's okay. Let people struggle with their doubts. Let them struggle with their questions. Let them ask questions. It's okay. 
God is not afraid of your doubt or your fear, and He will help you to walk through it to get you to a place of faith if you want Him to. I'll never forget, years ago when I was in college, one of my friends brought her friend and said, she needs to talk to you. I go, what? Well, she's an atheist, and she has some questions. And I look at my friend, I'm like, "Uh, why didn't you answer their questions? I thought you'd do better. Thanks. So she asked me a bunch of questions, and I sat and talked to her. And then I said to her, listen, I got an idea. Why don't you pray to this God you don't believe in? I said, and if, it's not, if you don't think there's a God, then you're not really praying. You're just kind of saying words. But why don't you say, God, if you're real, would you show yourself to me? I said, now, he's God, so I'll tell you the rules. You don't tell God how to show you. You don't tell him, kill my enemies, give that guy a traffic ticket that passed me, you know, that kind of stuff. Don't throw a chair against the wall. But God, if you're real, in whatever way you want, show me you're real. And that's all I knew to tell her. She had questions I couldn't answer. Some I went, no. what about the dinosaurs? Uh, you, uh, Two months later, she came back and said, I feel like God showed me he's real. I want to give my life to Christ. Never be afraid to answer people's questions. Never be afraid to ask questions. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest theologians, said this, Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one. Here's your second challenge. Be honest about your doubts and fears. When you have doubts, God doesn't... (laughs) Like when you say, God, I really wonder about this. God doesn't go... You do? It's like when you confess sin. You know, we confess sin like God's never noticed. Like, God, I'm sorry I had this thought. And we think that God's going to go, oh, you did? No, God's like, yeah, I've just been waiting for you to say something about it. Confession's for us to get our hearts right with God. God already knows. Number three, God allows sadness but brings joy. God allows sadness but brings joy. Luke 24 He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their mind so they could understand the scriptures. Hear that. Where do you find truth? Go back to the Bible. Where did Jesus go? Back to scripture. Jesus said, this is what it says about me. He proved himself through the scripture. So when you're struggling with a theological question, don't just sit out on the beach and go, I wonder about stars and sand and giraffes and unicorns. Look at God's word. Hey, hey, study his word. And then Jesus said this. He he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. And he said, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. In John 16, it says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, listen, you will have trouble. I would love to tell you that you become a Christian and all of a sudden, (sighs) praise God from whom all bless all my troubles are over. No, as long as you're on this earth, there's trouble and pain and sorrow. And in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, why? Because he's overcome the world. Someday all this suffering, all this struggle will be just a a blink in the light of eternity. One of the smartest things I ever did as a youth pastor, there's only about two things, this is one. I was a youth pastor for 10, 10 years and I think I did two smart things. This is the second one. I took the kids on a mission trip up to Kentucky and we would go into the hollers. We'd go down dirt roads and we'd throw kids in a van and take them to VBS, and I'd have all these 7th and 8th grade students. We took about 80 one year, which is crazy. I was psychotic. But they would meet with these kids all week, do VBS with these little kids who were poor. Some of them didn't have shoes. They came without shoes to VBS. I'll never forget, at the end of the week, we started getting on the bus, and all these kids started getting on. And I heard one of the leaders going, where's your suitcase? Where's your suitcase? Over and over, where's your suitcase? I'm like, did all of our students lose their suitcases? I mean, 7th and 8th graders, it could happen. No. At the end of the week, those kids went to these kids and said, you take this home to your family and you give them whatever they need. And student after student, selfish 7th and 8th graders, 
had experienced the sorrow and loss of other children and realized how blessed they were and that sadness for them became joy to them and to the people that they helped. Don't ever, don't ever think that the pain in your life cannot be used by God. It can, and God never wastes a hurt. So whatever that hurt, whatever that discomfort is, whatever that question is, whatever that fear is in your life, whatever that pain is, say to God, God, would you, by faith, I know you're going to turn this sorrow into joy. So finally, take, thank God that he will bring joy from sadness. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to receiving his joy is to know that no matter what happens when you surrender to him, the Bible says the reason that Jesus came and suffered and died is so that when you and I receive him, the Bible, we use a word called Lord, but basically when you make him boss of your life and you confess your sin to him and you take on his righteousness, the Bible says you earn eternity in heaven, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. If you're here today or watching online and you want to do that, I'd love to talk to you after the service. You can send me a note and you can give your life to Christ. Maybe you're a Christian, but you've never been baptized like early Christians were as a Christian. Maybe you're baptized as a child. Maybe you're baptized at some point in your life, but you never really surrendered your life to Christ. I would encourage you, take that next step of faith and you will find joy even in the fear of taking that next step. You'll find joy. Wherever you are on the journey, take the next step God has for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for Easter Sunday. Thank you that you turn sadness into joy. And thank you, Father, that you use normal, everyday people and you fill them with your spirit and you change us. Lord, help us to take those steps day by day that we need to take even in the middle of fear, even in the middle of sorrow, even in the middle of sadness. May we walk in faith. Father, I pray for anybody watching online or anyone here today who take, needs to take a next step of faith, that today they would take that next step of faith, even in fear, so that they could experience your joy. We thank you for these moments today. In Jesus' name, amen. Normally we do